Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS journal series. And I'm super happy to have Azaskin Jimenez Serra with us today. Hello, Azaskin. Hello. Nice to meet you. Well, <laughs> thank you for inviting me to, to be able to show my work here. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to talk about your work. I think it's a really lovely paper. Um, that's one reason why I picked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this, where, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? So I'm located in uh, Madrid. Oh, OK. And uh, I work at the Center of Astrobiology, which is uh, 30 kilometers off Madrid okay. in the Ponte And uh, yeah, so we are there in Spain. How is the, uh, I was reading some news reports or something. So how has the summer been going in Madrid? Uh, it's been pretty hot. <laughs> what, is, yeah, what is- We've been uh, roasting here, yes. 40C, 41C, 42C? Yeah, yeah, we had a couple of uh, heat waves uh, in August, July and August, and that was uh, quite tough, yeah. yeah. Is it starting to cool down or are you still in the... It's now, yeah, it has started to cool down. So I think uh, fall is uh, finally coming. <laughs> cool. Well, you can't look forward to it. Yay, fall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. It is September 6, 2021, and I'm in Phoenix, and we are oh so slowly starting to cool down. Uh, we will still get pretty toasty today. We'll get up at 38, 39C or something today. Um, but it's going to be a very pleasant dry day. Seems like the moisture is disappearing a little bit. So we'll go back to the single digit humidity kind of stuff. So very good. Nice. Uh, good. <laughs> you do any, do you do any teaching there? Uh, no, it, this is a 100% research position. Love yeah. it. Yeah, although I've been, you know, I, I, I taught in the past uh, while uh, oh, yeah. I was in the UK, so I was teaching there and I, I really enjoyed it. Cool. And I tried to be in contact with students at the university, you know, for their master thesis and so on, for oh, yeah. summer internships. So it's always good to, to work with students. I really enjoy it. Absolutely. Very nice. Ms. Askin, what do you like to do for research? For research? So I'm an astrochemist uh, for background. Uh, and I'm mostly interested in and trying to understand uh, chemical complexity in the interstellar medium. So I focus in particular on uh, the initial conditions of the star formation, which is what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. But I, I'm also interested in uh, trying to discover prebiotic molecules mm, okay. in the uh, interstellar medium. So that's uh, the other part of the research that I do. Very nice, very nice. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article, The Complex Organic Molecular Content in the LS1498 Starless Core. And Asaskin, take us away. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is uh, the second of a series of papers uh, that tries to understand how chemical complexity uh, builds up uh, in these uh, quiescent uh, starless cores uh, mm -hmm. in order to try to understand how this chemical complexity starts and then is transferred to later stages in the, the formation process of a solar type system. So we are just focusing on the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. cool. So for a, for a first study, and this was back in 2016, I focused on, uh, on a core, on a starless core, that we know it's gravitationally collapsing. So this is what we call a pristella core. Mm -hmm. so we know that that core, this in particular, the one that I studied is L1544, we know that that core is going to form a solar type system. So okay. what we wanted to do in, uh, in this work for L1498 was to try to compare or try to understand whether a similar level of chemical complexity could be found in a starless core, so in a core that is younger in evolution. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the main idea of the, of the paper. Nice. Uh, so what we decided to do in the previous work, because these observations are very challenging, so we focused on two positions. Okay. Uh, one position is uh, located towards the, the peak, the dust peak of the core, so is where uh, the highest value of the H2 uh, column density is located. So that will be basically the center of the core. Mm -hmm. And then we also focused on another position, which is off uh, the center. So is the, in the case of L1544, it was about 4,000 AU okay. in distance with respect to the center. And we picked that position because it showed 
uh, or it was very bright in, uh, in, in a molecule, in methanol, which is basically the simplest complex organic molecule that we know of, was mm. one of the simplest ones. So we just performed very deep observations, very deep integrations towards these two positions to try to understand or to try to measure the abundances of complex organic molecules towards these two positions and then determine the abundance profile. So how abundant they were in each of these positions and then to try to compare with models and try to see whether we could uh, figure out the formation processes of these complex organics. Very nice. So this is what we did for L1544. So basically for L1498, it's exactly the same. So if you actually scroll down to figure one, so we picked this uh, Stalet score, as I said before, because we think it's at an earlier stage of evolution with respect to L1544. So we, we know that this, uh, this L15, exactly, that's L1544. So that's the one that I was uh, referring to before. And then the one that we are uh, focusing on in this uh, new paper is L1498. Okay. And as you can see, both cores, so there I'm plotting the dust thermal emission, which is shown in grayscale. Okay. And then I'm also overplotting the contours of the methanol emission. And as one can see, the methanol shows like a kind of ring-like structure yeah. around the dust thermal emission. So that means that most of the methanol is depleted. So it's frozen onto dust grains towards the inner parts of the core. So that's why we see it mostly in the outer regions where the densities are not that high. Got it. Not All right. Yep. I'm with All you. Right. right. Then, so as you can see, so these two cores are located in the torus molecular cloud. So they are located at, similar, at a similar distance. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing that one can notice uh, straight away is that uh, L1498, it's much more uh, extended. Yeah. So it's less compact. And uh, it is more kind of, uh, yeah, extended diffuse. While L1544 is more compact, so it's uh, the density is also the, the densities towards the center are higher. So the, H, the gas density towards uh, the center of L1544 goes above 10 to the 6 particles per cubic centimeter, while for L1498 is about 10 to the 5. So it's already more than a factor of 10 uh, okay. difference. Okay. So there are so what we think is that F1544 is more evolved because it is collapsing and then all this material gas is concentrating towards the center. Okay. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Then we, as I said before, we used the IDAM 30 meter telescope to integrate, perform these deep integrations towards these two positions uh, shown as a star uh, in the figure, which is the core center, and then also the cross, uh, which is the methanol peak. And then uh, just to give you an idea of how challenging these observations are, so we try to reach very uh, low levels of, uh, of noise. Mm -hmm. So reaching levels of about two, three millikelvin per frequency setup. So that required about 15, 17 hours of integration time per position. Okay. So that gives you an idea of how you know, challenging and also difficult. So it's difficult to convince the program committee to give you <laughs> a high amount of time, large amount of time <laughs> to, to reach awesome. this level. Awesome. You did a good job. You did a good job because you got it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so there, that's, uh, those are the frequency setups that we covered in. Uh, so those are shown in table one. And as you can see, so we, uh, we reached uh, noise levels uh, down to 1.82 millikelvin for some of the frequency setups. Very cool. Okay, so I think uh, from here, so this frequency setup covered a list of uh, complex organic molecules that some of them are listed there on the right. So as you can see, we had uh, force methanol, uh, then methoxy, uh, C3O, uh, K10, formic acid, acetaldehyde, you know, the usual suspects. So if you're an astrochemist, you've heard of these uh, molecules before, dimethyl ether, cyclopropenone, uh, and propinal. Uh, for the nitrogen, we also covered uh, cyanoacetylene, isocyanoacetylene, so some of the numbers, uh, some of the names are even difficult for me <laughs> to remember, <laughs> and uh, vinicyanide and methylacyanide. So all these, we covered all these molecules uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of frequency setups. Uh -huh, very cool. 
Okay, I think we can probably go to the next uh, figure, which I think is the observations. Um, they, that is the table, but I think we can probably go directly to the figures okay. because it's much uh, more friendly. Then, okay, so that's a sample of the spectra that we collected uh, towards these two positions. The zero zero is the center of the core, so is the position of the dust peak, uh, and that's uh, figure two, I believe, in the paper. And then I just show uh, some representative transitions of all these different molecular species that I've been mentioning before. Mm -hmm. um, right, so then these, I have to say that these were the same transitions, the same species that I also studied for the, uh, the work on L1544, so that we could directly compare um, the abundances of the same species also for, for the two cores. And that's something that we do also in this, in this paper. Uh, one question, help me with the notation a little bit here. Uh, I'm gonna assume the 817 to 716 is a transition, let's say in molecular bands. And then over here we have J values for the transition. So wanna help yeah, me so put out the J, Yeah, so the J, the J referred to the uh, rotational uh, quantum numbers. So these are rotational transitions. The S referred to the hyper, hyperfine structure. So some of these molecules they, so the rotational levels, they split farther uh -huh. due to the interaction with the nuclear spin. Then for methylformate, for example, so we have the A to seven, uh, and then we have this uh, subindex, which uh, are due to the fact that the molecule is not linear, mm -hmm. and then it, it is uh, an asymmetric top molecule. So it has three axes, and then those are the quantum numbers, which is the, pro the projection of the uh, angular momentum on each of the of the axes. I'm with you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Then uh, right. Then if uh, so, can you scroll? So can you zoom out a little bit because I think yeah. it will be easier if we compare directly the two positions. There we go. How about there? Uh, you want the whole thing? Yeah. Let's do the whole thing. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Right, let's try to see if uh, that can be <laughs> it's better. Yeah, so the very first thing that one can notice from here is that there's no detection of oxygen bearing cones. Mm. So for example, a species like methylformate, which is the one at the uh, top left. So there's, there's no clear uh, signal of that molecule in there. Nothing about the methyl ether, which is the one right, the one right next to it. So it's CH three O CH three. There's mm -hmm. nothing in there. So no. there's maybe just a little bit of methoxy, which is the one right next. So it's very faint, uh, and it's uh, you know it's it, it's um, it's we think it's a detection because it's about the three sigma uh, level in the integrated intensity. But as you can see, these are very weak lines. Yes. And then the second thing that really uh, you can notice from these figures is that. Uh, in contrast to or opposite to the behavior of the oxygen bearing molecules, we see that the nitrogen bearing molecules, the nitrogen bearing combs are quite bright. So especially vinyl cyanide, uh, the one at the um, left down panel, and then the one right next to it, C, C, and C, uh -huh. that's also quite bright. Yep. Yep, you do get. But then it's also quite bright, but that's uh, that's actually not considered a complex organic molecule, so that's considered a precursor because it has less than six atoms. So that's the definition oh, oh, that we use okay. for a complex <laughs> organic molecule. It begins at six. I'll have to remember that. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, question: What is the A double A E E? Yeah, those are the different the, the different species. So some of these molecules. They present, uh, so depending on how they structure the, the energy levels, they have some different species, okay. which is the AA, EE, et cetera. And then uh, they, that's why I put the levels there, the labels there, to just uh, indicate the different transitions for methylformate from the different, uh, different species. OK, very good. I'm with okay. you. Uh -huh. And then for others, you can see the decay you see, for others, you see a lab label of K for CH3 and C, for example. Ah, uh, yes. Good. And then 
those are uh, for symmetric top molecules in which they show these different uh, ladders. And in principle, uh, so the transitions can occur. So these are for uh, selection rules. Yes. The of the selection rules and then the transitions cannot occur between the different K ladders. Got it. Very nice. Thank you. Um, yep. Okay. Then, so this is one uh, one big difference with respect to the previous work, as we will see later, because F1544 was very rich in uh, both oxygen and nitrogen being complex organics. But here, L1498, it doesn't show any oxygen being uh, complex right. organics. So that's one of the big uh, differences with respect to the previous work. OK. This, this, um, this result can actually be summarized. So if you scroll down and you go to figure four, I mean, we have a series of tables with all the different abundances calculated. Uh, you can see there the column densities and so on. But yeah. all that information is summarized in, in figure four below. Those peaks, methanol peaks, and here we go. That's a nice figure. Mm -hmm. Where we we actually compare directly the abundances that we obtained in our previous work for L1544 with the abundances that we have derived this time towards L1498. So in order to follow the figure, so uh, you see that at the top of the panel, I've just included the two the names of the two cores and with two different colors oh. when to indicate the different positions. So in yellow, I'm just indicating the position of the dust peak of L1544. Uh, in red, the position of the methanol peak for the same core. And then in blue colors, so in different, uh, different types of blue, so light blue, the I, position of the dust peak, and mm. then uh, the dark blue and the, the methanol peak. Okay. And then if we concentrate at the, at the bottom, you see that I have uh, put labels for the different uh, molecules, the different complex organics that we have targeted. Yep. Then if we first focus on the oxygen, okay. oxygen species. So what we clearly see, no, and this is something that we already saw in the figures of the spectra, what we can clearly see is that um, these oxygen bearing combs are not detected within our limits, you know, observational limits. Okay. Um, and then if we go to the nitrogen bearing species, what we see is that we do detect these complex organics, okay. but the abundances are much higher than uh, the ones uh, that we measured in L1544. There's a trend. Right. In general, all these complex organics seem to be enhanced towards the outer parts okay. of the core, not towards the position of the methanol peak with respect to the center. So that's a general trend in all the cores. Yep. So then the outer parts seem to be uh, an efficient location for the production of these complex organic molecules. Okay. That's one of the conclusions of the paper. So these outer regions at about a few thousand uh, AU are actually um, a very efficient or is one of the most efficient regions for the production of these complex organics. And then we'll see why uh, later on. Then uh, what we have done, so now that we have the abundances, yeah. what we have done then after this is just to try to understand what may be causing this enhancement in the outer part. Uh -huh. and to try to infer the formation mechanisms for these complex organics under these cold, very cold conditions. Okay. How cold are we talking? I, I have to say, I have to say that the formation of these complex organics, so especially under these cold conditions, is believed to be, ve to be very challenging because in the past, in previous works, people have been focusing on the star forming regions where the temperatures are higher. And if you have a lot of energy in the medium, yeah. Then these molecules can quickly form on the surface of dust grains because the small molecules radicals become mobile on the surface of dust grains, they react and then they form larger and larger molecules. That energy is not available in these cold sources. So we need to find all the mechanisms to explain the formation of these complex organics. What's the general temperature of these cores? 10K, 40K? 10, 10 Kelvin. 10 Kelvin. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 10, 
than Kelvin and low and lower. <laughs> so it's uh, so it's really close to absolute zero. So it's really impressive that we see these complex organics in yeah uh, in these environments. Indeed. Yeah. And okay. So then if uh, if uh, in order to try to see to understand how this uh, comes form, so uh, we have tried to model the core and then try to reproduce uh, the chemistry by using um, a chemical code. And this is a chemical code that has been developed uh, by Anton Vazunin, who is one of the co-authors in, in the paper. And then what we've done is we've used uh, the physical structure of the core as, as an input. So if you scroll down, we can have a look at the physical structure in figure five. There, we actually make a comparison of the density distribution and the temperature, the kinetic temperature distribution. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the core. And here, you know, it is really evident uh, what I said at the beginning that in 1544 it's much more dense towards the center yep. than in 1498. But the temperatures, you see that they are more or less about 10 Kelvin. So mm -hmm. they, there's, uh, there's no big difference between the two, but there is a clear difference in the density distribution. Uh, yeah, so the solid lines are the density and the dashed lines are totally The mm -hmm. solid are the density and then the dashed are the temperature. Yep, yep. Okay. okay. So what we've done is we've used uh, Anton's model. He's taken each uh, position across the core and then assumed a constant density and temperature yep. for the chemical model. And then he has run the chemical model for 10 to the six years. And then uh, by doing this, so he can obtain an abundance for each of the molecules for each position as a function of time. Gotcha. Yep. Makes sense. And then, so what we try to do is we find the time that best matches the observed abundances. Okay. Okay, so that we try to uh, get the best model, you know, for the for the time, or uh, that or uh, for the time that gives us the the best match with the observed abundances. Okay. Okay. Then, if you scroll down and we go to the next figure. And there we go. There's a lot. Uh, there's uh, some dense information about the chemistry. <laughs> in there that I think is probably, you know, if anyone is interested, they can go to the paper uh, directly. But in general, so the general idea of this, uh, of this uh, model, so is the following, as you can see, so this is uh, the best fit model that we get for a time of the order of uh, 97,700 uh, 97, years. Yeah. Then uh, this is a time which is slightly lower than the one that we obtained for L1544 that confirms the fact that L1498 is younger. Right. right. And then uh, what the model uh, provides, which is actually something that we already saw for L1544, yeah. is that the abundances tend to show um, um, or tend to rise towards the outer parts of the core. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then peak. Yep. Uh, approximately at the position where the methanol distribution peaks. And that's the vertical dash line, yeah? That's the vertical dash line, exactly. Okay. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So what is happening here, so I'm going to try to explain the chemistry, the different, the chemistry that happens in the different regimes okay. <laughs> of the core. So there are three different regimes in this type of cores. So when the extinction is low enough, so if we go to distances or to radii, to radii uh, larger than 10,000 AU, you okay. see that the abundance drops mm -hmm. you know, of all the, these molecules. Mm -hmm. What happens is that the extinction becomes low okay. and then all these molecules are photodissociated by the external uh, UV radiation field. Okay. Mm -hmm. Blown away. Mm -hmm. yep. If we go inwards, then extinction starts to increase. Then external, the external interstellar radiation field uh, kind of penetrates, so it doesn't photodissociate the molecules any longer. Okay. So that this extinction is 
So the, because the density is higher, it protects these molecules. But also there's something that happens at this position, at this location, that is the CO starts depleting in this region because the densities uh -huh. are high enough yeah. that molecules, and in particular CO, starts being uh, frozen or starts freezing onto dust grains. And that activates the chemistry on the surface of dust grains. Got it, which is what you're observing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we see this increase of the methanol, for example, which is a, a very important precursor for the formation of other com oxygen beating complex organic molecules. Right. Then the abundance drops towards the center because these molecules are also produced, but then the densities are high, are much higher than at, the, at this intermediate extinction regime, that then molecules start, be, start or become uh, to deplete back again. Okay. Yes. So this would be the theory of what of the chemistry that happens. Uh -huh. This was very evident in L fifteen forty four because the densities, as I said before, was very clear. So it was uh, much higher towards the center. So then we could see the depletion much more clearly. Okay. In L fourteen ninety eight, as you can see, so there's there's a you know there's a slight drop, but it's not too high. Yeah. One needs one needs to consider also that these are these abundances are calculated after considering uh, the convolution the convolution with the beam. So it's a large beam. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. yes. If we had a look at the at the models, we could see a sharp drop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Then what happens with the nitrogen? So what we think is uh, all these differences between the 1544 and the 1488. What we think is that nitrogen, the nitrogen chemistry is much faster. So it, it kicks in uh, yeah. earlier in the, in the evolution of the Stahler score. So CN is a molecule that uh, starts being produced early on or very early. And then from CN, one can produce HCN and then you can start producing CH3CN, HC3N, so HC, so, all these. So that's why these molecules are very abundant or are much more abundant at this, uh, at the age of L1498 with respect to L1544. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, oxygen bearing uh, combs are not detected. And then that means that uh, CO has probably started being depleted on the surface of dust grains, but it hasn't been, it hasn't suffered or it hasn't experienced a very strong depletion as in L1544. Okay. So it hasn't had enough time to suffer this catastrophic depletion of CO. So this will be like the CO snow line, you know, that we see in discs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So this will be the region right, of, right, the, right. of the CO snow line of crystalline cores. So it hasn't suffered that catastrophic CO depletion to start forming these oxygen being complex organic molecules. So that's why we see these differences in the chemical composition of what we think is the origin of these differences in the chemical composition between L1498 and L1544. So we think that what we should expect to see in these Stahler scores is naturally this evolution in the chemical composition. When we first start having these nitrogen being combs uh -huh. that are produced very efficiently. And then at a later stage, once the CO becomes depleting in a catastrophic way, yes. then that's when oxygen being comes uh, are produced. Okay. okay. And that's basically at the onset of a gravitational collapse. So that's when, uh, um, you know, so then the, co the core is collapsing and it's going to form a solar system. Very nice. Very cool. That's so I hope it was, uh, it was clear enough. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's great. Lovely. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. I mean, there are some, there are some inconsistent, there are still some inconsistencies between the model and the observation, of course, so we kind of reproduce everything. And then we think that these inconsistencies can actually give us some hints about the uh, chemical mechanisms for the formation of combs. So in the past, for example, we thought that these combs were produced um, by the release of the precursors from, from grains okay. by a mechanism called chemical reactive desorption. Mm -hmm. yep. 
Um, and then these comps were formed later on by gas phase reactions. Then, uh, you know, from these results, we are now probably changing that view. Uh -huh. And we think that these uh, complex organics are probably formed on the surface of dust grains and somehow they come off. Uh, we don't know now whether it's chemical reactive absorption or whether it is because the impact of cosmic rays. There must be a mechanism that actually gets these molecules off grains right. Right. that we don't know yet. So that's actually a very active line of research in, in astrochemistry. So there are nice results. Today there was a paper on, on, on the archive about that, in particular on the, on the impact of uh, cosmic ray cosmic ray desorption, so that's uh, it's an active field now. Very cool. Ms. Askin, number one, thank you very much for sharing your lovely article and observations and theory. No, very thank you. <laughs> and you hinted at it a couple times, uh, uh, particularly as we got near the end there. So, so let me ask you, uh, where do we go as a community? Let's say over the next next five years, are there additional starless cores besides these two that, that uh, 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 to be it done? Are you gonna get another 18 hours to study another starless core? Um, are there improvements to the theory that could uh, help distinguish between uh, which of these two paradigms that, that you mentioned for uh, the formation of these molecules? So, so where do we go over the next five years? Yeah, so I actually was able to, <laughs> to get more observing time on the centimeter already <laughs> to awesome. do another core. And that's something that we are currently working on. Uh, and okay. so this other core is just between 17B. Uh, and then we've done exactly the same studies, observing the dust peak and then the position of the methanol peak. Mm -hmm. And then we are now trying to understand, uh, you know, the, how the chemical evolution. This core is actually much younger than F1498. Ooh, okay. So this would be, you know, it would basically close the full evolution of yeah. starless core. So we would have a, like a very, very young core, one that is intermediate, that we know that it is collapsing or is accreting some of the mass of the gas from the outer envelope, but it's not collapsing inside. And then at 1544, which is collapsing. So we would have the three, the three stages. So then our goal is to compare uh, the molecular abundances of all these three, and then to try to see whether we can reproduce uh, that evolutionary trend that we already hinted with L1498. Right, right. So and then that in theory, you know, so as I said, so it's a very active uh, uh, field now. So we also plan to do the, the chemical modeling, uh, hopefully introducing these new results, theoretical results about uh, the desorption produced by the impact of cosmic rays that may help to get a better match with the observations. Uh, so that's the, the kind of thing. And then what I would like to do, of course, is to try to map many other, many other starless cores. We have maps, there was a sample of other starless cores, but just focusing on methanol and CO, because if you need to, you know, you probably need to target uh, brighter molecules, so you can go yeah. <laughs> and then it takes 17 hours, 15 hours for nine more cores. It's already challenging, so. Yeah, uh, I put a large program. <laughs> Please give me 100 hours. Um. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah so that's, the, that's the way we plan to go in the, in the future. Okay, very nice. I look forward to seeing your future articles on this topic and um, delving into some of the theory paper on cosmic ray uh, ejection mechanisms. So, very nice. He's asking, thank you once again for sharing your lovely article with us. No, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, goodbye.